Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. Today, you are joining me for an interview with Mark Shirtliff, the former three-term Utah Attorney General. He is the founder of Shirtliff Consulting Group and law firm, and the owner of the Commercial Clean Energy Project Development Company. He is the author of a historical novel called, Am I Not a Man? The Dred Scott Story. And he's a former US Naval officer. He's also the father of five children and has eight grandchildren. But the reason that I've invited Mark on the podcast today is because that little intro doesn't even skim the surface of his story. In June of 2014, Mark was charged with bribery and corruption charges as the Attorney General of Utah. His home was raided by the FBI, and as the next two years evolved until the criminal case was dismissed in July of 2016, there was quite an ordeal, quite a story. And if that's not enough to his story, it also involves a devastating motorcycle accident that involved 15 surgeries to save his leg, and then a fight with cancer. Our discussion today is not about politics. Our discussion today is about the human side of struggle, about the story from Mark on the inside. The hero of a story always has two journeys, the outward journey that involves the milestones and the outer struggles, the mountains to climb, the obstacles to overcome, but it also involves an inner journey of emotion, mental fortitude and failure, struggle, and sometimes that's the bigger story. So stay tuned as we get the inside story from Mark Shirtliff. Stories are our lives and language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story Power serves you best when you know how to use it. Mark, welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Lori. Good to be with you, and I'm really looking forward to this. I'm really pleased we ran into each other at the podcast uh, summit, and uh, you we talked, and now I'm I'm really delighted to be on your program. You never know who you'll meet at those things, do you? That's right. (laughs) (laughs) So many of my listeners are not from Utah. So while much of your story has been centered in the media and focused on over the years, can we start with a little background information and details of the case that was brought against you? And we'll kind of pick up the story there. All right. Well, so uh, I actually had just left office after serving 12 years. So three terms as elected attorney general of Utah. Uh, and uh, they started looking at some allegations against my chief deputy, who became attorney general after I did, and that bled over onto me. And so John uh, Swallow. Yes, John Swallow is his name. So the uh, the FBI and the DOJ initially were looking at it, but uh, after interviewing me, and they sent out their representatives from their uh, public integrity section from the Department of Justice, Maine. Uh, they decided they weren't going to they weren't going to be charged. They were going to file. Well, the local uh, county uh, district attorney, uh, who is a, has been a political foe of mine for quite some time, uh, I'm not going to go all into that, but he, uh, he decided he was running for re-election. He, I guess his theme was nobody is above the law, and so he, he clearly tied in my uh, investigation and, and very public arrest and all the free media he got from that to charge me with uh, a dozen felony crimes uh, as a former attorney general you know, one of the most devastating things I've ever experienced. And it was, of course, very open, very public. It seems like every single day there was something in the media and it was all a false narrative. For two years, it was a false narrative because I couldn't speak out. You know, I'm facing criminal charges. My lawyer, lawyers don't let me to speak. So the public mm-hmm. only got one side for two years. What gifts were you accused of taking, the bar- bribery charges and such? They're, uh, well, they were campaign contributions what they were kind of trying to focus on. And then it said, I, you know, I had flown on some private planes, but they were, they said it was for campaign contribution using someone's private jet, but they were actually not. The truth was I was doing those to raise money for a foundation. I started to treat sick meth uh, cops who were sick from busting meth labs and other charitable. So from start to finish, it was a false narrative. And we're, we're going to be able to prove now that uh, the 
it was all perjured statements and search warrant affidavits. FBI and local state uh, investigators lied outright, misrepresented omissions, and it's just one of those. I, I wouldn't have believed it if I, if it hadn't happened to me because I've been involved in criminal justice my whole life, and I just it just shocks me to think that law enforcement prof professionals and criminal justice professionals would go that far just to win something. You wrote to me, I didn't just believe in maintaining certain values, but I swore solemn oaths as a five-time scoutmaster, lawyer, naval officer, county commissioner, and attorney general to honesty, integrity, duty, honor, country, and selfless service to the people's good. So when you were falsely accused in this public forum with crimes um, alleging violations of those oaths, you mentioned to me that that was devastating. That was worse than all of the surgeries from your motorcycle accident, which we're going to get into, and worse than your cancer diagnosis and chemo. And I actually absolutely understand that those those attacks on our integrity those are devastating and while not as physical certainly as these other parts of your story your reputation the things you've always stood for the attack on your values tell us a little bit about where that took you emotionally as you've very well explained it was you know to to have attacked what the, the very essence of who i was or who i believed i was or tried to be I mean, I strove the whole time I was in office to never accept like a a, a, a fee to speak at an event. I, I was, I could take, legally I could take honorariums and I was offered money to speak at events. And I always just said, no, no, I don't want to, you know, make it look like anything. I, I could have served on boards for pay. Uh, the pay wasn't that great as attorney general. Uh, most of my attorneys made more than me, frankly, uh, but that's okay. I didn't, I wasn't doing it for that. And, and so... To do all the things and work so hard and to feel good about serving the people and the things that we started, it all gets lost. It's all, it all goes away. And then you're, the very essence of who I am was under attack and, and displayed all over the internet and, and local media. And that takes its toll. It's, uh, I've served for years on Youth Suicide Prevention Board nationally. I, that was one of my big emphasis as Attorney General to go and speak to kids at schools, junior highs and high schools, about suicide and so forth. And... I, th I never thought I'd be one that, that got to that point, but I did. I was in D.C., I uh, lost my job there that was finally after leaving office, after all those years, my, my family sacrificed. I'd lost all that. I hauled these charges. It was like standing on the subway platform and thought, how easy would it be? Everybody knows I've had all these surgeries on my legs and I can't, you know, I'm, I, uh, I limp a lot and my legs fail. It'd be so easy just to collapse my legs and fall in front of that train. You know, it would look like an accident. So what but kept you from doing it? You know, Lori, I think I have to just attribute it to divine intervention because I my phone rang and it was a friend of mine who was a former director of the National Association of Attorneys General. Uh, she lives in Virginia. She's a 70 year old, I call her my Jewish mother. <laughs> <laughs> but she, uh, she just called and she, she said, what's going on? I, I couldn't even answer. I was so stunned and so upset. But then I told her and she said, sit down on the bench right now. I'll be there as soon as I can. And she rushed over and took me to her home and sat me down and we talked. And, uh, you know, it was that. That, that saved me. I told her the other day, I told her, reminded her when she was talking to me about my case that she'd saved my life. And she said, of course said, no, 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 but I think she did. One, one of the beautiful things about our stories often is the the people that show up. The, I, you know, in the hero's journey, there are these people and we call them mentors or um the people standing at the crossroads that give us the magic elixir or that help us when, the, when we're in the really, really dark places. And I'm sure that you've had a lot of experiences with this along your route. Mm -hmm. and this would be one of them. Um, be, before we get into, I want, I want to hear more of those, but I think that we need to hear more of the story about when did the motorcycle accident happen? When did you have to go through all of the surgeries and when did the cancer what's the timeline with these other aspects of your story all right so i was i was an attorney general from 2001 to 2013 
And in 2007, I was uh, leading a motorcycle ride to raise money for our, our fallen police officer memorial that I had helped build. And uh, gifted by just that day by Tim Harley, this beautiful road king. Uh, and I just hit one of those coming around a corner and gravel and it had been raining. And usually you can just slide out on that. But it caught my left foot under that 900 pound motorcycle and just destroyed everything below my knee. Wow. Yeah, it was, and so life flighted the whole thing and also tore off my shoulder. I mean, I just, I was, it was pretty, pretty serious injury. Uh, and a lot of pain, obviously, a lot of surgeries that didn't work. It wouldn't heal. They tried plate and screw. They just couldn't get it to heal. And Wow. What, what years was this? So 2007 through 2008. Okay. Uh, it was it was September 2007 and and uh, in the summer of 2008 it still hadn't healed and so I had two options cut it off wow or yeah. use a thing called an Elizarov frame which is an external fixator that they put on and tighten and make you walk around in pain <laughs> horrible pain for because you got these rods going through your leg but um, it worked and by December of 2008 uh, I could take the frame off and my leg was healed how is it now you good. It's good. It's uh, no, it's never. It's, I never got, got much feeling back in in my leg. I destroyed a bunch of nerves. It's it weighs five pounds more than my other leg because it's just bigger. Really? Yeah. Um, but you know what was uh, through all that and all that pain and all these the struggles in and out and you know, I, I ended up been times I was in the hospital. I ended up getting massive infections in my leg. It was just a really tough time. But you know what got me through that? Tell me. It wasn't just one mentor. It was just people across the board. It, I was really surprised because, you know, Democrats, I was a Republican attorney general, the Democrats came up as a Democrat association that every religion, uh, I would get news that someone had put my name in the, in the Western wall in Jerusalem, or I'd been prayed at the mosque or you know, my name in the LDS temple. I even heard from a friend who's Navajo. She said, we had a, a, them do a blessing way for you. I was pretty Pretty cool, pretty extraordinary. I, I mused on that. You know, when we're when we're sick, sometimes people do put down all the things that divide us mm. and reach out when you're sick. And then I thought, well, our nation is divided. You know, our communities are sick. Why can't we come together on things like that? Why do we have to pull apart? It was something that I thought about starting a blog, but uh, yeah, yeah. called the the politics of cancer or something. Uh, but then. Yeah, so that that's uh, quite an experience, but I did have a lot of help, as you can as you can hear. Don't don't you believe that? So th this isn't even in comparison, but I'm going to use it because it's a current <laughs> example in my own life. But my my basement recently flooded. I probably talked about it on another podcast, and <laughs> and there was, you know, just being a single woman, I, you know, I have to maintain the house by myself and there was heavy furniture to be moved and there was foundations to be dug up because things, um, you know, the water was coming in through the foundation. So there were a lot of, um, a lot of things that were outside my ability to do on my own. And while the struggle of it has been really, really difficult and I've had to ask for a lot of help, I can, and I'm still in the middle of it, frankly, but the spaces where other people come together for you, the spaces where they show up for you, the spaces where you, you want to do things on your own and you don't necessarily want to need other people. And, you know, and that's a, and sickness and injuries are a, a prime place for that, a place is to be humble, but a place also where people show up, where community comes together, where um, you see the goodness in people. And I think those spaces serve so much more than what they are on the outside. They also serve to give us hope and to connect us to one another and to build relationships in ways that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So there's multiple levels when you have those experiences and people come together for you. Oh, for sure. I could, you're absolutely right. I couldn't have said it better. And I don't want to, also I want to say, look, I, I couldn't have made it through all that without my wife who had to push that wheelchair mm -hmm. uh, and uh, help me in and out and up and down and the whole thing. She was really, really extraordinary. Yeah, families and friends, and when they show up, be beautiful bonding space. Kudos to your wife and your family, because all of these things that you've had to go through, that's not a, that's not a, a 
a journey of solitude. That is a space where your family, your children, in fact, one of the issues that came up when the FBI raided your home was that you weren't home when that happened and your children and your wife took the brunt of that. Do you want to tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, there's <laughs> there's a photograph out there. Someone pulled it up recently. I was on Fox 13 the night of, because I was in DC and just look at my face and you'll know what I'm feeling <laughs> on that uh, after I learned. So I'm, I'm in DC and I get a call from my daughter. Just, you know, I thought I just screaming, crying, uh, absolutely distraught. Daddy, you catch your breath. What, 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 daddy? You know, just she finally, after they'd tormented her and threatened her and made her sit there at the table and threatened to kill the dog and everything else, they oh, let her go. Bad. Yeah, because a neighbor, and actually my wife wasn't there, it was just my daughter and my son, Tommy, who, who has been helping us with the microphone, he said uh, they weren't, there were no parents there. So a neighbor, a friendly neighbor came over and it took Annie under her arm and took her to her house. And that's when she called me and wow, such a, oh man. So I knew then, first of all, I felt failure because it's, a, it's daddy's job to protect his kids. And not only had I not protected her because of me, mm. they were there. Not, she had nothing to do with it. And she was traumatized. And to this day, she's still having some problems. That, uh, she has PTSD on it. And uh, so that, that's tough. It's hard to know you've, yeah. you failed your family like that. Well, m might I suggest that you didn't fail your family and that if that's truly the way you interpret it, that it that we can reframe it because you know those weren't things that you like you said if those allegations are false then it was a system and a other people working toward you that set those things in motion rather than yourself and it wasn't something that you could have known about that the FBI was going to handle it that way that's not your responsibility okay no, I know you're that that's true. It's hard to to process it still. Um, sure. Absolutely. No no doubt about it. And knowing that your family has been hurt or traumatized, that's a space all of its own. But truly the actions of other people are not um a responsibility that you have to take if if your actions didn't bring those. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, to her credit, Annie, you know, she she ended up wanting to come with me to every court appearance for one reason. She would stand there and stare down the FBI agents and the State Bureau of Investigation agent who had come in the home. Hmm. And she, <laughs> I was surprised she wanted to do it. I mean, that was uh, crazy. And she would. She'd stare him down. She's a tough little soccer player. And there she was. How old was she? She was 17. And she's like five foot four, 110 pounds, soaking wet, tiny little thing with four big. FBI agents with body armor and automatic weapons and laser sights pointing at her and screaming at her. That's, you can imagine what mm -hmm. that did. So she was doing really well for a while, but recently as we've filed a lawsuit to be compensated for those violations of civil rights, she's had to relive that stuff. And so she's been struggling uh, a bit, but, but um, you know, she's, I just talked to her today. She's up in or Oregon with her sister and she's doing okay. We'll be okay. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Tell us about this newest lawsuit that you filed, the $30 million against the state of Utah. It's against the uh, state of Utah, the county district attorney, and the FBI and the FBI agents. You know, we, uh, we hand an awful lot of power to uh, elected district attorneys, to law enforcement officers. We give them a badge and a gun and the ability to take away our life perhaps liberties, our, our financial, I mean, that's a ton of power. And it only works, Lori, if they do their jobs and protect the civil rights of all of us. You know, it's, it's a balancing act that while investigating potential crimes, uh, they have to recognize that the Constitution protects us in our homes, in our communications, the Fourth Amendment. And, and for an officer to outright lie on a search warrant affidavit so that they can search my home. The judge doesn't know. She has, she's supposed to be able to believe in what they're telling her. The public should believe it, but they did. They lied and we, and we'll prove it. And so the only way to hold them accountable now apparently is to sue them. And uh, there's federal law that, that allows that to happen to hold them accountable and to compensate injury. 
uh, compensate my loss of income, my inability to get jobs. You know, you can imagine who's going to hire a lawyer who's facing charges like this. Uh, how's my daughter? You know, her, she's got a lifetime of emotional issues. How do you compensate that? So they do compensate pain and suffering, emotional damage, re loss of reputation. And we're just going to take advantage of that. It's interesting how often it's brought up lately, you know, the lawsuits against police officers. And, you know, I know that, you know, there's a, there's a few things that go wrong or a few that get caught and, you know, and then there's a lot of public discussion and debate and, and it's very heated on both sides. But I do think that it's important that the law enforce, you know, they do have a tremendous amount of power. And while they have to deal with, some of the most difficult and damaged people in our society is, and it makes them jaded and it makes them, you know, tough and they have to defend themselves and they're always, you know, in fear for their own lives or often, you know, and that sets up a certain mindset. There's also, you know, they really work for us. We, we um, don't want to be treated poorly by them, especially as law abiding citizens. And there's rules that they need to go by and, and they are there to protect us, not to demean us. And it, it's an issue and it comes up over and over. Absolutely. And listen, I'm, I'm the world's biggest supporter of law enforcement. I've worked with cops since I was a JAG officer, worked with Naval Investigative Services all the way through my prosecutorial years. I attended, Lori, I attended 13 police officer funerals as attorney general. Mm. I, I, uh, I taught for years in the police academy on things like use of force and search and seizure. Uh, I created a foundation, as I mentioned, to treat sick cops. I mean, I, I am a friend of law enforcement and the vast majority are good, decent public servants. The problem is when you have those who will uh, uh, abuse that authority, then they wreck it for everybody. So, you know, some of what I'm doing now in, in holding these FBI agents and others accountable is uh, they ought not to be out there. They ought not, they ought not to be police officers if they're willing to do that to lie and in order to, to charge somebody and to search their homes, et cetera. So that's, that's, the, that's why it's there. And I, and we do have to hold those people accountable. And I, and for my part, I hear from lots of police officers, uh, rank and file, I bump into people all the time and they're, they're, they support me, even though I'm suing cops because they say they, they, they give them all a bad name. The bad ones do. So since you're a lawyer and you deal with this all the time, it may be less traumatic than it would be for someone else, but you've just recently, this past week, filed this lawsuit. So you've got some, you know, you had some more struggle ahead of you in in court and what's going on. Is this, feel like it's dragging this out more and more? Are you okay with it? Does it increase the the internal dilemmas and trauma or is it just you know, taking care of business. How, how do you feel about what's moving forward? Well, you know, one of the other burdens obviously is we're bankrupt. I mean, you can imagine the, the devastation of on our finances of what this did. Uh, not, not to mention the fact that my attorney's fees are a million dollars that, that uh, I'll never be able to pay back unless I, you know, get some compensation or some help from the state. So um, it has to be done. I don't want, I really don't want to be vindictive. You know, I, I like the story, Guy, it's a short story by Guy de Maupassant called The Piece of String. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the essence of the short story is a man who was accused falsely of picking up a piece of string. And even though the next day they find the actual guy who stole a wallet that was out by where he picked up the string, mm. he can't let it go. He has to, his whole, the next month he has left of his life, all he can talk about is it was just a piece of string. And those are his dying words. He gets so caught up in, I'm innocent, you know, and declaring this and wanting to clear his name. I don't want to be that. I don't want to, but it, it needs to be done. Uh, my family deserves it. I tried, we tried for a year to go through the administrative process to try and settle this, to try and get them to do an investigation of the officers and, and nothing would happen. So I think we're just left with this. And How long do you think it's going to last? Oh, well, the federal courts take years. <laughs> mm. I'm representing one man who is a, a county constable for the same type of thing for a malicious prosecution and it's been four years since he filed this complaint um, wow. so it's it's a it's a long struggle and it's but it needs to be done and hopefully they'll just come to the table i mean i'm we're, we've told them already we're willing to settle for substantially less than what we're suing for just to get be able to pay off the bills that taken care of and move on as i've interviewed people and had the privilege of getting inside their stories it's not 
ever just like one thing goes wrong. <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the most intense stories have multiple aspects of, and often multiple levels of adversity just piled on top of each other. And, you know, during this stretch too, you also were diagnosed with cancer. Um, when was that? When was that diagnosis? So it was 10 months after my leg had been saved. Wow. And, and it was also, I, I uh, thanks to friends who were persistent in saying, you need to really go see my gastroenterologist because you have a pain in your, in your gut that I just put off for a while. And uh, that led to finding the, the tumor in my appendix. It, it, it was a stage four killer tumor, but wow, it was in my appendix, so it hadn't burst yet. And so when they they were able to pull that out in the nick of time, it had eaten almost all the way out. And it would have, if it had a burst in my stomach, in my abdomen, I would have been dead. But it had excreted, uh, it was called an excreting tumor. And so it's kind of my lymph node. So I, I had the wonderful opportunity to go through chemo, which I wouldn't wor- wish on my worst enemy. Right. I, I hear that over and over. You said to me, my parents taught me to set goals and stretch for them and never quit, never give up. Those lessons became a part of me through athletic competition. So when things became darkest and most bleak, I got through them by being determined. (laughs) Not let the bastards win. Bastards meaning prosecutors, persecutors, political enemies, disease, depression, anxiety, and a host of personal demons. I think that is well said. Tell us more about that. Well, first, I, I I, I led a charmed life. You know, everything went my way. I was like expected or not expected, but my parents talked about the time I say, hey, you know, you, you're going to be president of the United States someday. I mean, I was, I excelled in school without much trouble. I was, you know, athletically inclined. I did well there, captain of the football team, all, all the good things that came my way, dated the, the, you know, the cheerleaders, uh, everything. And then elected office. I never lost an election. Everything always seemed to go my way. And I remember pinching myself sometimes thinking, gosh, you know, I, I'm worried. It's, is, it, is there a, good, a shoe going to drop someday? And then it did. And it was, it wasn't a shoe. It was a ton of crap, you know, and it was, as you say, right. And it seemed just one after another on top of each other. But it, it was, I think it was that, uh, that, that determination and fight. And I, I look back on the experience in high school basketball where we just, for some reason, could not win. And I, it was everything to me. And we just lost it's on flukes every single game. And I, I wanted to quit. Half three of the my teammates quit. They didn't want to be a part of it, and I just stuck it out. And that's kind of when they just had this just never say quit. And that's my dad. My dad's never, never give up. During this whole ordeal, you know, it hurt him. I mean, when I was sworn in, to think of him, former naval officer, educator. When I swore in, I swore in the first time. I want him to hold the Bible for me while I was being sworn in. I have a picture I cherish where he's just got this look of pride. And then think of what he experienced. He believed in me, but I didn't see him for that four year period that he didn't say, hang in there, son. <laughs> so yeah, I, had, I was blessed to have parents like that, to be helped by people. But you know what also helped me, Lori, again, going back to, to mentors, it was all during this prosecution, all my friends in government fled you know, all the business people I'd worked with, they went, they ran to the hills. And most friends didn't call. But it was, you know, a, a senior citizen in the parking lot of the Smiths come up to my window, knock on it. Are you Mark Shirtliff? Yes. Well, we don't believe that stuff. And, you know, hang in there. We're proud of you. You did a great job. It was over and over again. And all ages and you know, just regular people, just regular people. I remember being at a, at a Real Salt Lake game and the kid behind me had a mohawk and he was all tatted up, you know, and I, I admit I looked at him a little profiling. and they looked like prison tats, you know, stuff, it's just my job. And he taps me on the shoulder after the game, he goes, Mr. Shirtliff. I'm like, oh boy, what? It's like, you're Mr. Shirtliff, right? I'm like, yeah, he says, you know, kick their asses. I believe in you. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, you don't even know me. So I know, I know, I, I know what you did. Uh, I know the service you rendered, and I'm pr- and I'm and I'm grateful for it. And just hang in there; that this will turn out okay. It's amazing. That was really, really special, and it continues to this day. 
I love that. I know. I love that. I love those personal connections. So you have told us a number of things that have kept you going that, you know, you've mentioned some of the, the brighter moments that mostly revolve around people, around the love that you've received during your hard times. Is there anything else that keeps you going during the dark times? Well, I, I have a personal faith in, in God and that he's watching over us. I, I, there are times when in the deepest, darkest, you think you're not there anymore, but then I see these, what I call tender mercies. Some people call them coincidence, I guess is the word they use. And, but there, there's some times where it's just happened, where it's just, it's okay, I'm here. And here's a little thing to show you that I'm still here. Uh, and, and so that, you know, that helps. And to know that other people have gone through persecution and false allegations and all kinds of things. And really people have suffered more than me. I mean, I still think I have friends who've lost children. I just, <laughs> To me, that that would be worse than anything I've been through to date, right? And uh, they sometimes they somehow get through it. <clears throat> so that helps my personal faith in, in God and my Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and um, I think I don't know. I think everything else has just been this, the help of others and a good example growing up. And I have a friend right now who I went to lunch with. He was my I won't say who he was a man of faith, a man of great integrity and service. And he is, Lord, he's on the edge right now. He didn't want to go home on Father's Day. He is at the bottom. And he said, how, Mark, he said, when I look at my problems, it's like a boo-boo. And when I look at your problems, it's like you lost your legs or something. How did you make it? How did you get through? Help me. How do I get through this? And I, I just try to be the friend and listen to him and let him know how important he is in my life. And I'm sorry I'm getting so emotional today. Wow. These are, uh, <laughs> this brings up, you know, a lot of stuff, but. Um, I, appreciate, yeah. I appreciate the emotion because it's real. And the things we're talking about are, are the real emotional parts of the story, that inner hero's journey that has everything to do with emotion. And if it's not, and the things we're talking about are the things that drive you into your very own Gethsemane. You know, I mean, yeah. this is the tough stuff. If you weren't emotional about it, I would worry about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, and then again, just, uh, I just, I said that to him. I said, Paul, don't let the bastards win. And he goes, what do you mean? Who, who are the bastards? And I'm like, it's, it's those demons you're facing. It's, it's, it's you doubting yourself. It's all those things. Just, you can't give into that and know that there's people that love you. And then if nobody else does, I do. You're my friend. I need you in my life. Well, you, you and I had talked earlier about the, um, just the prolific amount of suicide that's going on lately, that there's such a war inside our own heads going on of hopelessness. And I just believe that the powers of evil, darkness, Satan, whatever yeah. you believe in, are really um, active inside people's minds and heads, taking their situations and then you know, creating that self-loathing, creating fear, creating self-doubt, creating um, massive amounts of unhappiness um, as people try to get through these hard things. So that's why I feel like these interviews with you, with the other people that I talk with, sharing these inspiring stories of getting through these dark swamps, these haunted forests, these dragon layers and making it through to the other side not giving up despite the fact that in all of our journeys there are those spaces where we desperately want to give up but we choose one choice at a time not to yeah and I, I agree with you and there's a scripture that says that i think is talking about our time right now i can't remember which scripture it is but it says that darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the minds of the people mm. and it is um the message, basically, I, I also share with Paul, he knows my daughter, Danielle, who right now is, I'm raising her four-year-old because uh, she's been going through some difficulties, but she's 18 months clean and sober. She's up in Oregon. She's getting, she's back in school. I think she's turned her life around. Uh, I know she has, but she had some dark times and she had a suicide attempt at 14 when she was just so sad and everything was dark and nothing was ever going to change. And she ran into the kitchen with me on her heels, grabbed a knife and tried to stab herself. Wow. I caught the blade and for a half an hour, it was a tug of war. Daddy, let go. I don't want to cut you. 
and you know, let me go because I don't want you to hurt yourself. And you know, and so we had her, we had to have the police come and you know, restrain her. But she got in the hospital, and a couple of days later, we got her home, and she's sitting right here where I'm sitting right now, talking to you at the kitchen table, looking out the window. It was a sunny day, sunny morning. She goes, Dad, that was really hard. She said, that was really, really bad, huh? I said, yeah. She goes, well, it's a bright new day. She said, if you ever talk to kids about suicide or anybody, at that darkest moment, if you can just hold on one more day, just get to the next day and take it from there. And there's a chance to make it. And I've lost so many friends, and I'm sure you have, and others. Everybody knows somebody who you just you just think, why, why, what, what could we have done? But it's that's what we think we have to do is talk to them about it, and just just one more day, just hang in there. You know, I shared this on a different podcast, but there was a point when I was um, talking with a therapist, and it was it was a really hard time, and she just looked at me and said, "Lori, can you make it one more minute?" And I said. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I can make it one more minute. And then she said, can you make it, you know, five more minutes? And I, you know, I'm thinking this through because I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm being honest and authentic. And yeah, I can make it five more minutes. Can you make it another hour? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I can make it another hour. And, you know, and she just incrementally came up. Can you make it one more day? Yeah, I can do that. And then you start to realize sometimes you just take it minute by minute. But you make the choice, like like you just said, when you get to that darkest moment, or was it your daughter that said it? When you get to that darkest moment, make the choice, even if that choice is um, you run to someone and be be around someone for support, for energy, for love. Make the choice to put the gun down, to walk away from the space. Make the choice, maybe just to sleep it off. You know, whatever it is, make the choice not to leave. Well, and, and a message to everybody out there, obviously, is that uh, you can save lives. And I don't care what your faith is or whatever your religious belief, you, everybody gets prompt, promptings. If you get a prompting that to reach out to somebody, then act on it. Mm. I tell this to school kids, you know, you can, you, you can save lives. You have friends who talk to you. They, they talk to you. They won't talk to their parents or their religious leaders, but they'll talk to you and you will see the signs. But you have to speak out. You have to talk. To put your arm around and bring him in your circle. You can literally save a life that maybe nobody else can, and that's true for all of us. Well, and you, n- you never really know. That's why those promptings or impressions or intuitions are so important yeah. because yeah. you never really know what anybody else is going through. You never know when that critical moment is. But if you feel like, hey, I, you know, I need to go up and give that person a hug, or I, you know, I need to offer this, or I need to be there, or I need to reach out. Do it because maybe you are the one saving the life, just like your friend on the on the train track, right? She yeah. called you at exactly the right moment. Yep, absolutely. That's that's the that's the, so that we're all in it together. And I think I think that from my experience now with a little bit some of your your podcasts and shows is that that's what your program's about, and uh, well, to a certain extent. And uh, I appreciate that. I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. What do you want people to remember about your story? Uh, first of all, don't believe what you read in the press. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. Uh, but uh, no, it, it's it's this that. I mean, whatever your situation, however dark and bleak it becomes, whether they're physical ailments or whatever, maybe you're having other problems, emotional, just look for help, talk to friends, reach out, hang in there, give it, you know, try and make it one more minute or one more day. And uh, yeah, just look for the positive. I mean, I've been, I've, the people used to call me Pollyanna because I'm a Pollyanna. I mean, I'm a, I look for the good and everything and I was always cup half full. And so I, 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 maybe, maybe some of this was meant to be, and if it wasn't meant to be, I try to learn from, from all of this, uh, you know, and, and become a stronger and better person for it. And someday I want to be able to do more to help people who have gone through what I have when I get on a right footing. And what have, what have you learned? If you don't mind me asking. And I, I don't know if you're far enough away from all of it yet to be able to see that super clearly, but one, one or two things you've learned from, you know, when the shoe finally dropped, when all those shoes just kicked the crap out of you, <laughs> you got all this, all these fun experiences. What's your takeaway at this point? 
One is that there are some bad people out there who want to hurt you and uh, bad things will happen. Uh, but I found that the majority of people out there are good, that they are kind and caring and want to help. Uh, and uh, sometimes if you, at that moment when you seem to not be able to help yourself, I mean, all the positive thinking in the world isn't going to work and it's going to be somebody else who reaches out to you. And I, I just love that. That's, that's, you know, it's it. it. It restores my faith and belief in mankind, uh, even though there are people who literally willfully, maliciously wanted to hurt me <laughs> for whatever their own personal gain. There's a lot more people who are there to help you. And uh, that sense of community needs to be talked about. It needs to be, I want to get back to that in politics in particular. I call myself a, rec a recovering politician, so I really can't get too close to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I just want to, you know, I think we can solve these ills facing our, our communities and our nation if we can just get past the, the, the things that separate us and recognize what we have in common. And ultimately, uh, I believe this, uh, my, my motto, my personal motto through the whole time in my public service was a quote from Cicero that John Adams also liked, and it's the people's good is the highest law. I believe it so much I tattooed it on my arm right, before this all happened. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the day, it's still whatever we do ought to be about the people's good. That's what politics were supposed to be about in the beginning. That's why we came together as communities and formed, uh, you know, these associations to help each other out. And we just seem to have forgotten that nationally, clearly, even locally, we just let too much divide us. And I just want us to see, you know, see us pull together like 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 what happened with the and i know we don't want to talk politics but with the separating families it seems like people came from every all across the board every ethnic every political every, every they came together and said this is wrong this is not america and it changed <laughs> so let's keep doing that kind of thing coming together right i love how you are um you know, you can take your personal experience and that not only does it teach you things personally, but it also teaches you things in the bigger realm for which you are experienced, which is politics and, you know, leading and guiding and directing larger groups of people and that you see that in that bigger space as well. That's nice. Well, thank you. I, I, that's still uh, uh, something I love and I'm concerned about and I love this country and I want to see things go right and it's just it's not i have so many friends who are, uh, who are democrats i worked who were attorneys general i worked across party lines with them and a couple of them went on to higher offices and senate and they came back and said market has just gone in the last 10 years to to the point of we can't get anything done because it's all about who's right and who's wrong and yep there's a lot and, of that. And the media of course plays into it and and it's a pretty messy scene out there as it you is. know better than anyone <laughs> but I haven't lost hope and I, I think our community still can people can still reach out and I, and I think that uh, I'm glad that we have this alternative media now mm -hmm. because it seems like even you know what do you believe anymore and there, is there fake news and is there slant and it seems like they're just all warring with each other uh, and cannot seem to get along well maybe it's maybe it's through things like your program that are going to spread and people it's going to reach real people who have the same concerns and and say let's let's do something it's it's a populist idea that i really like real people yeah. with real stories and yes. you know the lovely thing about and the interesting thing about the internet is it it has become the campfire the new campfire around which our stories are told yeah and and everybody it. has a voice it's no longer you have to make it past a publisher in order to have something done heck you can self-publish books and mm -hmm. and just with all of the resources that are available and that means there's a lot of noise going on there's a lot being said and there's a lot of crap and a lot of meaningless stuff but there's also um there's no gatekeepers Everybody has a chance to tell their stories. Everybody has a chance to contribute if they want to. Social media is all about people constantly telling their stories. And this opens up communication in a way that is that can be liberating because it can't be controlled. That's right. I love it. Yeah. And uh, I have hope and it. it gives me hope, frankly. Yeah, it's a good thing. And thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. I appreciate having you on the podcast. Thanks for the opportunity, Lori. Absolutely.
adversity comes to each of us in different packages. It's a tale of deep struggle. The things I take away from this discussion are the the beauty of community, the beauty of people coming together to help, the struggle and those adversities that we go through. We all go through something. We all go through those. And when people are there, it builds, it strengthens, it connects us. And this is a beautiful space. I want to encourage or challenge you this week that you be the person. Um, if you're in a space of one of these really deep spaces of adversity, then you can either choose to look outward and away from your suffering so that you're not focused on it by being the answer to someone else's suffering. Or there's also sometimes that space where you are just so involved in your own survival that somebody else needs to show up for you. And if that's where you're at, um, pray for that. Send that out to the universe. Um, send out the need that someone will show up to help you. And if you're in a space where you can listen to your intuition, to your promptings, that you can be the person this week that will be creating that sense of community and help and be there for somebody else in one of their dark times. Thanks for joining us today for Mark's Story. Love Your Story podcast is about inspiring and empowering each of you wonderful listeners. I really am grateful for you and love you and I'm hoping the best for all of your life stories. And it's to empower you to find the strength to live your best story on purpose. That's why we look at other people's stories and their overcoming and how they do it. I've provided tools on the website, loveyourstorypodcast.com, tools to help you reframe your past stories that are holding you back. I've been there. I've done that. I have those tools. I've created a course around it so you don't have to go recreate the wheel. And it's there for you. I have also created the 21 day life connection challenge. Life stands for um, living intentional and fearless every day. And this challenge, you sign up for it. You get 21 new tools over the next three weeks, one a day for creating more connection in your life, for creating more possibility in your life and for helping you to move forward, creating that life story that you want on purpose. They're wonderful. Please join us on the Facebook um, Love Your Groupies, Love Your Story Groupies um, Facebook page because there we're sharing stories about what's going on in the challenges. We're sharing notes on the podcast we like the best. Um, we have some groups that are doing the 21 Day Challenge together. Um, it's a closed group, but please just ask to join and we'll, we'll put you in. I'd love to see you on the inside. Thanks for being here. Have a great week.